Hello to all of you and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Kirsten Cullenberg. I am the Director of Programs at the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. I wanna thank you all for joining us this evening for this very special virtual program featuring Ian Morris and Francis Fukuyama. A reminder to our viewers that you can purchase a copy of both of the books we'll be discussing this evening. Um, Professor Morris's book is called Geography is Destiny, Britain and the World, a 10,000 year history. And Dr. Fukuyama's book, Liberalism and its Discontents, they are both uh, available for purchase right now through our partners at Interabank Books. You can go to interabankbooks.com to order from this fantastic local bookstore here in Dallas. No matter how tempted you are to purchase from Amazon, I do encourage you to support our local bookstore partners. If you aren't yet a member of the World Affairs Council, perhaps this is the first time that you are engaging with us, please join us. We love to have you join uh, our community of engaged and informed citizens. Uh, you can visit dfwworld.org for more information on our different membership options. I have a couple of uh, organizations to thank this evening. First, I'd like to thank the United Nations Association's Dallas chapter uh, and their representative Kai Stansberry, who we'll hear from in just a moment for their promotional partnership. Additionally, I'd like to recognize the council's newest institutional partner, NEC Corporation of America. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to invite our partner, Kai Stansberry from the Dallas chapter of the United Nations Association for just a couple of brief remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Karsten. The United Nations Association Dallas chapter is honored to be one of the cooperating partners here today. This program is a vital part of our commitment to advancing global engagement and the belief that each one of us, now more than ever, can play a vital part in diplomacy and achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We actively look to partner with organizations like the World Affairs Council, whose commitment to quality programming leads to informed thinking, conversations, and actions that transcend tradi traditional borders and lead to lasting solutions and global problems. So thank you for inviting us to be part of this wonderful and important dialogue. I hope that we can all take away something that moves us to be more informed and more engaged. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, Kai. It's really a pleasure to partner with you. We're looking to partner with more uh, on more things in the future, so thank you. It's now my pleasure to invite our speakers uh, for to, to join us in this conversation. Beginning with uh, Ian Morris. Ian Morris is an archaeologist and historian and is the Jean Becker and Rebecca Willard Professor of Classics and Professor in History at Stanford University. In addition to a Stanford appointment, he is also a senior fellow at the Ideas Think Tank at the London School of Economics and is the Institute, and the Institute for Advanced Studies at the University of Toulouse and a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Max Planck Institute. His new book, Geography is Destiny, Britain and the World, a 10,000 year history, tackles the ebbs and flows of Britain's relationship to Europe and the world and how it has changed within the context of a more globalized world. Joining him is Dr. Francis Fukuyama, well known for his best-selling 1992 book, The End of History and the Last Man, which might I just add was required reading for me in school, has appeared, he has appeared, it has appeared in over 20 foreign editions. Today, he is the Olivier Nomellini Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. He's also director of Stanford's Ford Dorsey Masters in International Policy and a professor of political science. There's a lot of uh, different, uh, different things that added to your name, Dr. Fukuyama. Francis's new book, Liberalism and Its Discontents, examines the emerging forces which have fractured our civil society and threaten the liberal order. Gentlemen, it's wonderful to have you here. I wish it were in person, but it'll have to be next time. Absolutely. Thanks very much for having me. Wonderful. It feels like it's a Stanford night, and so I'm trying to figure out how we're going to navigate this conversation. We certainly have a lot to discuss, so I'd like to start by addressing each of you and allowing a brief discussion on your books before we dive into some broader subjects. And I do want to add, I invite our audience to start submitting questions just as soon as they come to you using the Q&A submission box at the bottom of your screens. So Dr. Fukuyama, I'd like to start with you, if I may. It's been a couple of years since my days at school studying political theory, so I'm hoping we can begin with a vocabulary lesson. What does liberalism mean? Uh, sure, because I use liberalism in a different sense than it's used either in the United States or in <laughs> Europe. In the US, liberal refers to people that are left of center, 
uh, progressive, you know, probably in the Democratic Party. In Europe, liberal has a different connotation. It usually means that you're part of a center right party that's pro free market, uh, but socially uh, fairly open, like the German Free Democrats. Uh, I have a much broader definition of liberalism. It really comes from the origins of liberalism in the middle of the 17th century, where Europe had just come off of 150 years of religious warfare. And liberal thinkers began to say, why don't we lower the temperature of politics by not making it revolve around substantive ideas of the good life as defined by Catholicism or Protestantism, uh, but simply say that our order wants to protect life itself. And we're gonna do that by promoting uh, a system that recognizes the individual dignity of uh, every citizen, tries to protect it through a rule of law, but allows diverse communities divided by religion or nationalism uh, to live together peacefully by tolerating one another. Uh, and I think that respect for uh, individual rights and uh, the universal dignity of all human beings still remains one of the core ideas of liberalism. Uh, sometimes people associate it with a particular set of, uh, of economic ideas, either a small state uh, or in some cases a larger one. Uh, I don't think for my purposes that matters. I think that, you know, Sweden is a liberal state because it does protect uh, individual rights through a rule of law, as is the United States, although we've been having problems in that regard. Um, but what's really important is that limitation, the limitation on government power uh, that protects a sphere of freedom and autonomy for, uh, for everybody. So how is liberalism different from what many, pe many people hear what you just described and say, oh, that's democracy. How is liberalism different from democracy and why choose to write about liberalism rather than threats to democracy in the current well, world? Well, you know, liberalism and democracy are oftentimes closely allied. Democracy is really about uh, having a government that responds to the will of the people through elections, multi-party, hopefully free and fair elections, whereas liberalism really is about the law and the restrictions that law and constitutional orders place on government power. And it's possible to have a liberal autocracy. So sometimes Singapore or Germany in the 19th century is spoken about because they have pretty good respect for property rights and, and individual rights, but no democratic elections. On the other hand, one of the troubling things we're seeing now is the rise of so-called illiberal democracies. So Viktor Orban in Hungary claims that that's what he's trying to build. It's a democratic regime. They just had a big election where he received another parliamentary majority, but he doesn't respect the independence of the press. He's tried to pack the courts. He's gerrymandered. He's, you know, manipulated the law to his own, um, in his own self-interest. And so that would be an illiberal democracy. And I think the reason I have focused on liberalism rather than democracy, I believe in both of them, and I think that they both need to go together. But the canary in the coal mine is really liberalism. Uh, you have now populist politicians all over the world, you know, Narendra Modi in India, Erdogan in Turkey, Orban in Hungary, and unfortunately, Donald Trump in the United States. They're all legitimately elected, but the first target is really the law and the constitutional structure that limits their power. Uh, liberalism is the first thing that's attacked. Once you weaken the law, then you can also manipulate democracy. So you get gerrymandering and election manipulation uh, and so forth. But I think, you know, liberalism and that rule of law is, is the first thing that we've been, we've been seeing, seeing a deterioration in around the world. Mm -hmm. It's the democratic backsliding, but you called the, uh, the rule of law the canary in the coal mine. I think that's, that's incredibly appropriate. I'd like to expand more on this by talking about different aspects of liberalism. I've heard you speak on the kind of three main points: the liberalism is good for is has pragmatic, the pragmatic, the moral, and the economic. Can you expand sure. on that for our audience? Yeah, no, that's simple. So there's really three reasons why you should be a liberal. So the first is this pragmatic uh, fact that liberalism is meant to govern over diverse societies. Uh, it was originally meant to reconcile religious differences. In the 20th century, it's reconciled different national differences. After World War II and 
two really horrible wars based on aggressive nationalism. Uh, Europe created the European Union, a liberal world order in which people could live peacefully without you know, these nationalist assertions. So that's the pragmatic part. The moral part really has to do with the protection of human autonomy and the idea that our dignity uh, is something that needs to be respected by governments and by fellow citizens. And you know, it really uh, recognizes the ability to make moral choices as the core of what makes us human and what makes us equal. That's the grounds on which liberal societies you know, give us rights uh, and try to protect those rights. And then the final uh, issue has to do with economics because among the rights that liberalism protects is the right to own private property, to transact uh, commercially, and therefore liberal societies have historically been strongly associated with economic growth and with economic modernization. So even China, which is by no means a liberal state in terms of respecting political rights, began to modernize in 1978 by essentially granting liberal property rights, quasi property rights to first to peasants and then to a broader category of people who could buy and sell you know, their homes and could transact freely. And the miracle that happened thereafter really would not have been possible had China not introduced certain liberal economic ideas, you know, into its policy mix. And so that's the third reason that liberal societies tend to be the richest societies in the world and they're good at, you know, peace and prosperity. And that's what a lot of people want. So we've talked about the good. What are the critiques? We, especially in, in under, under the frame of modern American politics, the left and the right. What sure. are the, the common critiques that are there? Well, so, you know, in my view, uh, the problems have arisen from deformations of liberal ideas that were started out good, but then were carried too far. So on the right, you had neoliberalism, what's called neoliberalism, which I would uh, limit to the kind of University of Chicago market oriented economics that was strongly associated with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher in the political world uh, that saw free markets as really the solution to virtually every social problem uh, and denigrated the role of the state. And so in this period, the state was cut back, markets were open, you created a global liberal order that led to a lot of prosperity and economic growth, but also to a lot of economic uh, inequality and a lot of instability as markets were deregulated. And so you had this escalating series of financial crises that hurt ordinary people, uh, but left you know, all the Wall Street hedge fund managers uh, uh, you know, still doing pretty well at the end of all that turbulence. And that in turn, I think has provoked a lot of populism, both on the right and the left, that kind of economic uh, inequality. The, um, the corresponding deformation on the left really has to do with a certain form of identity politics. Identity politics can be liberal because, you know, you have a marginalized group like African Americans that want to mobilize uh, to push for their rights. This was really the idea behind the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King. But certain versions of identity politics say, no, actually, our fixed group identities are the thing that's the most essential about us. And what we want is recognition, not as an individual, but as a member of, uh, you know, of, a, of a group and rewards and, and um, uh, you know, resources ought to be distributed based on those fixed characteristics rather than what we uh, accomplish as, uh, as individuals. And so it threatens you know, the individual merit idea that really lies behind a lot of liberal uh, politics and leads to both, I think, intolerance and in some cases, you know, disrespect for uh, procedural rules that are very important in a liberal society. That in turn, you know, what you might call, so the, the first one you would call maybe neoliberalism and the other one you might want to call woke liberalism. And that has in turn stimulated a big backlash among more traditionally minded uh, Americans that really don't like the emphasis on race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, and so forth, because they think that it's undermining uh, traditional cultural and moral values. And that, I think, that combination has led to this paralyzing polarization that our, our society suffers from right now. So how do we come back? 
how do we get back together to to be that that champion for the liberal order around the world? It's it feels like often, you know, as as Americans, we are you, people champion democracy around the world, but I feel like what they're really championing is the liberal order. How do we come back from that polarization? Well, I, I wish I had a simple answer to right. that question uh, because it's deeply buried in our society and economics and culture, and walking all that back uh, is quite. Uh, difficult, but there's a couple of things that I think we can do. I mean, one has to do with liberalism and the nation, because I think that liberals in many cases have given up on the idea of national identity. You know, liberalism believes that all human beings have rights, which they do, uh, but they're very, you know, suspicious of nations. But I think nations are actually critical in, uh, you know, enforcing rights, and you don't have actually a meaningful uh, set of rights unless you have a rule of law uh, that that does enforce them. Uh, and therefore, I think that, you know, you need to fashion national identity in a liberal fashion. It needs to be open and accessible to everybody that actually lives in your society. Uh, but it also needs to generate a certain amount of patriotism and emotional belonging. And that's one of the things that I think the left has kind of conceded to the right, you know, that they're the patriots, but in fact, you can have a liberal form uh, of patriotism. Uh, and so that's at least one beginning point for an attempt. Finally, you know, this is why I wrote the book, is that I think that, you know, politics and policy are often downstream of culture and culture is downstream of ideas. And it's been a long time since, you know, I mean, I think many people in my generation certainly grew up assuming that liberalism was correct and then finding out that not everybody agreed, but we've lost, you know, the justification. Why, why do we want to live in a liberal society? And so I think it's really important to re-articulate the underlying ideas, you know, what I said, pragmatic ones, moral ones, and economic ones to explain why it is that people should not be afraid to say that, you know, they're liberals and they're proud of that and that that's the form of government that they want to live under. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. I'd like to, and I, I feel like we could talk about this for hours. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now bring in Professor Morris, if I may. You write about geography and destiny, how it drives history and how history defines what geography means in turn. Can you expand on your thesis here? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Yeah, I mean, Frank was just saying, you know, politics is downstream from culture and culture is downstream from ideas. And I guess I would say they're all downstream from geography. This is what's driving everything along. But it's a, when it's a sort of a metaphorical stream, not a real one. So it flows both ways. And so um, geography you know, drives history along, but history drives the meanings of, you know, drives what geography means. And I think you know, the, the secret of success throughout history has been to understand what is happening in the geography of the world you live in, what that geography means, um, and then figure out how you can best adapt um, to the, the meanings of the geography around you. And uh, the, the, the long-term stories, I think you only really see this when you look at very long-term history. My book, it goes back 10,000 years to the point when the British Isles first form and waters rise at the end of the Ice Age, turns what had been a peninsula sticking out into the Atlantic into these, well, these thousands of islands that make up the British Isles. Um, you've got to look at this long-term history. And when you do, you see, you know, it's all these things going on in determining what geography means. But ultimately, it really comes down to just two big things, that the meanings of geography are driven along by changes in technology, especially technology connected to communication and travel. Um, but the changes in technology, they are also connected to changes in organization. And so these things keep changing. They keep changing what the geography means. And that keeps changing how people need to act to, to succeed in the world. What, I'm, cu I'm curious, what drove you to write about the 10,000 year history of Britain? Yeah, well, I've been writing books for, for some years. I started out my career as a sort of 
fa fairly normal archaeologist and historian, you know, looking at a particular time and a particular place. But then I found that if I kept enlarging the scale of what I was looking at, new answers to my questions kept occurring to me. And I carried on doing this for a while and then realized, oh, you know, I'm actually getting more interested in the big scale than I am in using the big scale to answer the questions I started with. And so that was when I turned toward writing long-term global histories. I wrote a book called Why the West Rules for Now that came out in 2010. It was the first one of these. And, and I, so I wrote several of these books. I had a great time doing it. But this little, little voice sort of kept nagging at me in the back of my head, which was my, my proper historian voice, which kept saying to me, you know, this is all very well and good, and you may be having a very good time doing this, but real history is actually made by real people on the ground in real situations. So if you're grand theorizing at the 10,000 years scale doesn't actually explain specific things that happen it's all kind of a waste of time and so I kept thinking you know what I should do is now write a new book that takes these big theories and boils them back down so it flips the telescope around looks at a particular problem and says can this explain this problem and so I'm thinking along these lines, and then I wake up on the morning of June 24th, 2016, and discover that the, the people of the British Isles, in their wisdom, have just voted to leave the European Union. And it occurs to me, you know, aha, this is like this perfect test case. Um, is this just something, the way a lot of people were saying at the time, is this, this a, a product of the here and now, a reaction to the, well, the sort of particulars, you know, Frank is talking about in his book, or is it part of a much, much longer story? And, well, obviously I came to the conclusion, yes, it's part of a much longer story, otherwise I wouldn't have written a book and you wouldn't have invited me along um, right. this evening. Well, that's exactly why I'm so glad that we have you two gentlemen together this evening. Um, we, we, we have titled this program Shifting Landscapes. It's kind of a play on words of the, the, the landscape of the world order and the, the liberal order that we so value and geography as destiny. So let's talk a little bit more about, you've, you've talked about the drivers of technology and those developments and the way that people organize. Why, are, why is that so important? And then I know we'll talk about in a few minutes I know you have a couple of maps that you have been using to explain some of this. If you have that available, I do invite you. You're welcome to share that with our audience. Um, but if not, we can just chat about it. Um, so let's talk about technology a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Why yeah, is that well, so important? I mean, maybe I can sort of you know, put, put the two things together, the you know, your question about technology and organization and the maps, since I, I have got the maps. So here, let me Please. see if I can share my screen without messing up completely. I usually manage to do this okay, but uh, uh, that I think is what we want and share. Okay, so hopefully we're in business now. You can uh, see what I'm seeing here. So this is just a picture of the cover of the book. Never hurts to show the cover of the book. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, I, I I look at my book about this 10,000 year story about British geography and the, the things that are changing its meanings and you know, there's a lot of details in British history that have been explored in tremendous detail by many many scholars but it seemed to me that the whole 10,000 year story really breaks down into just these three big phases driven by the changing meanings of, of the geography and I sum these up in, in three maps you know it's a book about geography so if you can't tell the story with maps something has gone seriously wrong here. <laughs> so I summed it up with three maps and the first of them I do love this first map I gotta say completely bewildering map. So just take a moment to explain what on earth we're looking at here. This is a, a quite well-known map in Britain. It's called the Hereford map because it hangs in Hereford Cathedral now. Painted around the year 1300 by a guy named Richard. That's pretty much all we know about him. And this is big, by the way. It's about four and a half feet across. And what you're looking at, um, it's a map mainly of Europe, but um, east is at the top of this map because uh, these are medieval maps. East goes at the top because that's where Jesus will come from when he returns for the second coming. So east should go at the top. The center of the map, and hopefully you can see my little pointy thing here. The center of the map is, of course, Jerusalem because it's a map of the Christian world. So Jerusalem, that little circle in the center. So everything's kind of flipped over to one side compared to what we are used to seeing on maps. So the sort of blackish triangle here, this is the Mediterranean Sea, um, the Atlantic is over here at the edge, like is Italy, Greece, and here are the British Isles over here, these blobs kind of squished in bottom corner of the map. And this map, this really sums up um, the vast majority of Britain's history, disconcerting as it is to look at. Um, but I would say for all the way up from about 10,000 BC to about 500 years ago, because people are living in a world of low technology and relatively simple organizations, the result of that is um, 
the, the, well, the two the two basic geographical facts in British history are British Isles are islands, obviously, and then they're really close to the continent as well. Um, and the whole of the story has been this kind of back and forth dance between the insularity and the proximity. And what this map sums up really nicely is how through most of this story, the uh, proximity to Europe trumps the insularity. So like you see the English Channel here, this is the English Channel on this map. The English Channel is narrower than the River Nile down here, which obviously isn't true. But um, the guy who painted the map, he, he grasped the basics of British history, is just an extension of continental history. Britain is part of Europe, its story is part of Europe, but Britain is not the centre of the stage. Britain is crammed in and the wings down here. The centre is down in the Mediterranean, the Middle East. That's where all the people are, the big ideas, the wealth. All the inventions start there and kind of roll out to the north and west, coming to the British Isles last of all. It gets everywhere else first. Britain is at the bottom of the heap. Um, and the English Channel, English Channel is a highway rather than a barrier. It doesn't keep anything out. Everything floods into the British Isles. And basically, all the way up to 500 years ago, British history is about dealing with these facts. Um, that basically English history is about what comes their way from the continent, Scottish, Welsh and Irish history are about what come their way from England. And we see this huge variety of different ways of trying to deal with this, trying to understand the geography of the times and how to make the most out of it. And then it, it only really changes very dramatically about 500 years ago. We move from this Hereford map, we move to what I call Mackinder's map. This is a map um, published in 1902 uh, by Halford Mackinder, the founder of the London School of Economics. And you see on Mackinder's map, Britain has made this journey from the edge of the world to the centre of the world. Um, and the reason this has happened is because technology and organisation have changed, and that changes the meanings of geography. So the big technological change is you get ships, galleons, that can close the English Channel and simultaneously open up the oceans of the world. And um, the ability to do that, closing the English Channel, would allow government in England to effectively take England out of Europe if they want to do that. And they can open up the oceans, so like secure behind a moat, the English Channel becomes like a moat, secure behind a moat, they can unite the whole of the British Isles into one organisation, ruled from London, unite the rest of the world into this global empire of commerce dominated by Britain. Or at least they can do that if they have the organizations you need to raise the money you need to pay for it. Because this is like really, really expensive. This is very high tech stuff for the 16th century. And the problem with having organizations powerful enough to build and pay for and maintain a fleet big enough to close the channel against continental rivals is that simultaneously a government big enough to reach into your pockets and take your money? Because that's, of course, how they're going to pay for it. And not everybody likes that idea. In fact, a lot of people really hate that idea. And 16th and 17th century England, torn apart by conflict over, is this what we want to do with the new geography? Are we understanding it properly? And is that the way we actually want to go? And end result by about 1700, after killing hundreds of thousands of each other, um, people more or less decide, yeah, this is actually what we want to do. And secure behind the moat defensive, uh, English London governments unite the whole of the British Isles, spread out commerce all over the world. Britain very much becomes the top of the pile. The English Channel becomes a barrier, not a highway. The Atlantic now becomes a highway, not a barrier. Everything is kind of flipped around. And British rulers are really good at taking advantage of this geography. Uh, the, the problem Britain has had, almost finished now, the problem the British have had is that um, the same forces of changing technology and organisation that kind of shrank the world and pushed the British to the top, they just carry on changing. And by the time you get to about 1900, the Atlantic has shrunk to the point that Britain can't really dominate and control this anymore. And two great heaps of money have risen up in the world, in addition to the British one. One based in Europe, particularly Germany, the other based in North America. And Britain's 20th century history was largely about coming to terms with these great heaps of money. And they, they do come to terms with the challenge from the German one by fighting two world wars, beating off the German challenge. But the only way to do that was by basically putting Britain under the wing of the American mountain of money. And you see British statesmen at the end of the 19th century going through this agonized process of, oh my God, do we really want to do this? Because it's like they, they British fight two world wars against the Germans, but they like simultaneously fight two financial wars against the Americans and resoundingly lose the financial wars against the Americans. 
And so the position we're in now, I would say, um, brings me to the third of my three maps, which is another kind of disconcerting map. But again, I love this map. What this map shows you is, um, it's a map of the world, obviously, but like the normal maps we look at, uh, like the one you use at the World Affairs Council, each country gets an area on the map proportional to the number of square miles of the surface the planet occupies. This map, you get an area on the map proportional to the GDP of your country. And so it kind of, I would say this is actually a much more informative map than the ones we normally look at. We see what are now three great mountains of money, the North American mountain, the European and especially West European mountain, and now the new Asian and especially East Asian mountain of money. And this is the shape of the world that we all actually live in. And the British, like everybody else in the world, have got to come to terms with this map. And I think everybody in the West has got to come to terms, particularly with the fact that the world now contains this third East Asian mountain of money. And it seems to me this is going to be the dominant fact for the 21st century, the most important element of the new meaning of geography, this East Asian mountain of money. And I think when historians in the future look back on the Brexit decision, what they'll ask themselves is you know, not about immigration policy and all the other things British politicians got so bent out of shape about. They'll say, did this help the British come to terms with the rise of the East Asian mountain of money or did it not? Because I think the historians of the future will understand perfectly well that the 21st century, it's going to be about Beijing, not about Brussels. And so th this is why I finally come to this conclusion that, yeah, if you really want to understand a decision like the Brexit vote, or for that matter, um, the election of Donald Trump in the US, or a whole number of other things going on in the West, you've got to take the 10,000 year perspective. You've got to understand the meanings of geography. And only then can you understand what's actually driving the, the world that we live in. Perfect. I, you answered a couple of the questions that I had written down, so thank you very much for that, especially the concept that the 21st century is going to be about Beijing and not about Brussels. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, Asian, that East Asian pile of money, that Chinese pile of money in a few moments, but I'd like to just quickly, um, we can bring in Dr. Fukuyama here to talk about oh, something that I would like to speak on. That We saw on that map, the very top, it was a thin little red line for Russia. Yet they have such a huge global influence right now, at least perhaps not economically, but in other ways they exercise their, their influence. They have this influence. Can you expand on, on that, uh, the little sliver versus the giant uh, piles you saw on that map? Oh, I, I, do you want me or Frank? Uh, who, whoever would like to, to take, oh, okay. to take that. I, I, could, I could start. Let's, let's just talk uh, Russia. Let's talk Russia. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think that most observers would say that um, Russia is a very one-dimensional power uh, to the extent that it commands a mountain of money. It's a pretty small mountain that's really based on gas and oil. And I think if you project forward towards a world, you know, a net zero world that we're all hoping to get to by the middle of the century, uh, you know, the uh, importance of that asset is going to uh, be reduced. I think the problem uh, really with Russia, well, there's a geographical one that, um, you know, it borders on a lot of countries uh, and has a national identity that seems to very much uh, involve dominating those countries, uh, unlike, you know, let's say Australia or Canada. Uh, and, um, you know, the, 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 the second is that you have a regime there that is just willing to take crazy risks. I actually wrote my doctoral dissertation about Soviet threats to intervene in the Middle East and compared to the former Soviet Union, I mean, they were very, very cautious because they're nuclear power and they understood the dangers of escalation. But uh, you've got a guy uh, running Russia right now that has really cast a lot of that aside. And he's been, you know, he's been rewarded for it because in Syria, Venezuela, a number of places around the world, the fact that he's been willing to take these risks has really made him a player in regions that are very, very far from Russia. Uh, but, you know, he may have made the mistake of his life uh, by invading Ukraine because he's bitten off uh, something that he really can't chew. Uh, and I think that, you know, the outcome of this war is going to be very important 
in understanding the distribution of that power uh, going into the, you know, into the future. But Ian, I'd be curious to hear your take on it. Yeah, well, I, I must say, I think uh, Russia's outsized influence in the world really just has come down to the fact that they've got more nuclear weapons than anybody else on the planet. And so long as that is the case, it just changes all of the calculus, I think. I mean, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin can't be made to pay for his aggression in the same way that Saddam Hussein could be made to pay for his, um, at least in the first Gulf War, um, because he's got more nuclear weapons than anybody else on the planet. So what lessons can we take away on Ukraine here? The name literally, the name Ukraine means borderland. How is geography their destiny? And speaking to Dr. Sumbiyama's point, how can the idea of a national identity and nations standing up for those liberal values play a factor here? Yeah, Okay, yes. So, um, yes, as you say, Ukraine and old Slavonic probably means borderland. And mm -hmm. I think first lesson to take is don't live in a country called borderland. This is not going to go well. It never does. And so Ukraine, of course, it's been uh, people have been invading and slicing up Ukraine for 6000 years. And certainly in the last few hundred years, it's constantly been pulled different ways by Turkish Empire, the Austrians, the Russians, the Swedes, all kinds of people. I'm getting in there. Um, yeah, Ukraine is in a very unfortunate geographical position, and I certainly would not have to make any great effort to persuade Ukrainians that geography is destiny. And um, yeah, the, the, I, I say that their great problem is Ukraine is a, a sort of existential issue for Russians in the way that it is not for Americans. And I think not that I have a great deal of sympathy for Vladimir Putin, but I think any Russian leader um, is going to be very conscious that for the last 400 years, the major threats to Russia's security have always come from the West. I think this is what Putin meant when he had that famous line about the collapse of the Soviet Union being the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. That it rolled back this 400 year long Russian strategy of pushing their borders as far to the possible as possible to the West to get themselves some sort of geographical space against what they've traditionally seen as aggressive European than American powers. So if you're sitting in Moscow, seeing the world through that sort of cultural strategic lens, then of course you're going to feel threatened by seeing Ukraine leaning toward the West. But that's not to say, of course, that the valid response to that is to go ahead and invade Ukraine. I think we just live in a very, very different world from the world of Peter the Great. And I mean, I agree with Frank completely that the outcome of this war is going to be incredibly important for the 21st century. I think if Putin uh, gets resoundingly put back into his box, then that will illustrate that there are ways um, to control this sort of aggression that still do involve fighting, because obviously the Ukrainians have fought remarkably uh, amazing performance, but also that economic pressure can function to keep uh, the more aggressive instinct under control. Whereas, of course, if he succeeds in his war, it will suggest just the opposite, which I think will have some fairly catastrophic results. Yeah, I would, uh, I've been watching this with great fascination because one of the issues I've been very concerned with is the question of national identity and how it's developed and, and uh, defined. And one of the amazing things that's happened is really the development of a Ukrainian nation and in fact, I think Putin may be the father of Ukrainian nationalism in many ways by what he's uh, done, you know, by trying to deny a, a separate nationhood to Ukraine and arguing that Ukrainians are basically just Russians that speak in a funny dialect. Uh, he's actually galvanized this incredible uh, degree of national unity that really wasn't that visible prior to February 24th. Uh, so it's another important uh, dimension of national power, really, the idea of the nation and what kind of loyalty it can command. Since the war has begun, you know, maybe 100,000 Russians have left Russia, uh, many of them, you know, computer programmers, well-educated people that really don't see a future for themselves in this kind of a society, but something on the order of a quarter million Ukrainians living in uh, different parts of Europe. Uh, have gone back to Ukraine because they actually want to fight for Ukraine. Uh, and this is actually why, you know, right now Ukraine has lost momentum. It's, it's, in, a, it's in trouble right now because the Russians are really pressing them in the, in the Donbass and they've suffered really high levels of casualties. But 
I actually think that manpower, despite the fact that Russia is a country three times with three times the population uh, of Ukraine, more than three times, uh, is still going to run out of people sooner than Ukraine will because uh, you know, Putin, for example, doesn't want to call a general mobilization because he doesn't feel that he can count on the loyalty and the, you know, the, the support of his own people. And therefore, he keeps pretending that this is a special military operation, whereas you've got an entire society that is like a beehive that's suddenly been stirred up and they're, you know, they're mad as hell and they're going to fight back. Uh, and so I think the outcome of this war is still very uncertain and I do think that you know Ukraine still has a chance of actually driving the Russians out of the places that they've occupied up till now. Yeah, let's certainly hope so. Speaking on Ukraine, we have a question that's been submitted from our audience and I want to remind our audience you can submit questions using the Q&A submission box at the bottom of your screen and uh, please we'd love to have you part of this conversation. Mike asks, have the Chinese learned from the Russian invasion of Ukraine? If so, does this cause them to be more cautious or more aggressive toward Taiwan and other strategic objectives? Uh, well, I would think that from Beijing's perspective, it's got to make you a little bit more cautious in a number of respects. I mean, they obviously miscalculated, uh, you know, the capabilities of their ally that they said they would give unlimited support to. Uh, it's actually dragged them into a very difficult situation where they have to worry about secondary sanctions and. Uh, this sort of thing. It's an, I think it would provide a useful lesson about military modernization because prior to the invasion, everybody has said, look at how much money the Russians are pouring into new weapons. And, uh, you know, we see this every day on May Day. Uh, and the Chinese have been doing a lot of this as well, but they've actually not fought a war since this war with Vietnam back in 1978. And they also have a military that's really not uh, been tested. And as I said, you know, the Chinese leadership, one of their advantages is they're not crazy risk takers. Uh, and so I would say that, you know, I would imagine that they're probably sitting back right now trying to evaluate what the war means for them. And it's very hard for me to see how this is going to encourage them to, you know, uh, to move too quickly on, on Taiwan. I do think they've, they're committed to doing something about that. And I think that Xi Jinping would like to have Taiwan back as part of China uh, before he steps down. Uh, and that, you know, is going to be in another five years. Well, I don't know, maybe it'll be 10 years at the rate we're going. Uh, uh, so, uh, but, but I, I, I do think it's probably made him more cautious. So speaking a little bit more on China, Professor Morris, you had mentioned that obviously technology is a key factor um, in everything we've discussed this evening. So how does that play moving forward with China? All the technological, technological advances coming forward, we talked about how the 21st century, Beijing matters more than Brussels, that realignment. Can you speak more broadly on that as far as the posturing we're, we've, we've been seeing there? We moved away from kind of sharply defined states of war and peace on at least in that front. So what does that look like moving forward as far as you're concerned? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of American strategists now like to say that instead of these sharply defined states of war and peace, we live in this age of perpetual campaigning. Like everything is sort of uh, jockeying for position and shifting around all the time. And you know, clearly, technology has become one of the major fronts in this, this non-stop campaigning. And not not so long ago, I mean, 15, 20 years ago, you would regularly get you know, well highly educated highly intelligent people saying things like, oh, you know, the Chinese are never going to be a technological superpower because it's not part of Chinese culture. And they're very good at copying things, but not doing things for themselves, which never really made the slightest bit of sense. But I think that the last 20 years of history have just underlined how that is a, a very foolish way to look at the world. Um, and China had, a, you know, after the, the what they call the century humiliation, the 1840s and 1940s, China had fallen so far behind the West I and mean, science and engineering technology, they had an enormous amount of catching up to do. But they've been going about 
this extremely vigorously and aggressively. And I think one of the one of the big battlefronts in the 21st century is going to be um, the ability to, to develop the new technologies, to master um, new sources of energy, um, you know, all these areas in which China is trying as hard as it can to compete with the Western world. You know, I would uh, say that China's got a problem that's related to the fact that its political system is not liberal. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen this with this zero COVID policy, which in my view is really crazy. Uh, and it's really due to the fact that Xi Jinping doesn't want to admit that it's a crazy policy because it's his policy. Uh, you know, one of the things that's happened is the Chinese have replaced the collective leadership of the Deng Xiaoping era with basically the leadership of one man. And this is um, a defect of all authoritarian systems. You know, they don't have checks and balances. And when they want to move ahead rapidly, as China has done over the last 30 years, it's very good because they can take decisions quickly and decisively in a way that democracies can't. But it also means that they can make mistakes on a scale that you know, democracies can't because they don't have these checks and balances. And so one of the things I would look at in China uh, going forward is whether the increasing authoritarianism in their system isn't going to be an increasing liability. You know, we saw them last year crack down on their whole tech sector. Now the Chinese tech sector, Tencent and Alibaba and Didi and all of these companies were really amazing. I mean, they're growing like crazy. They're bigger than their American counterparts because they were actually part of a market system where the entrepreneurs could respond to market signals and somehow the authorities in Beijing decided that this was too dangerous and you know they really pulled the chains of all these companies and uh, you know it's hard to believe that this isn't going to have an effect on innovation and China's real ability to compete uh, because you know state centered I mean states play an important role and they have in the United States as well but you know this kind of pull it, putting the brakes on uh, your own sector, I think, is something that um, you know the Chinese may pay a, a big price for down the road. Something that I've been um, personally, you know, in my conversations talking about um, is that it feels like many that live, you know, many of the Chinese citizens, they get the benefits of the you know large economic powerhouse that is China, yet they live in an illiberal society. So with Chinese influence spreading across the world as far as the, the, the Nisa Road project we're, we're seeing and their influence in projects across the African continent and, and, and even beyond that. I wonder if there is going to be, and I suppose this is what your, 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 your main point is, Dr. Fukuyama, a, a, a willingness to turn away from liberal society if the individuals are appeased. Does that, I hope that that makes sense. Um, I see that in yeah, um, the U. Well, I mean, it's a question. So there was this modernization theory that I believe a version of, you know, uh, a, a couple of decades ago, that as you got richer, you would develop an educated middle class and that this middle class would then demand greater political participation. And I think that this was the assumption that many people had about China, that as they got to the per capita GDP level of South Korea or Taiwan, that like those two Asian countries, they would democratize. That's obviously not gonna happen. I mean, they've shot past you know, those rivals already and uh, there's no evidence that Chinese middle-class people really want uh, democracy. And so um, you know, the question then for the future is, do they have a sustainable, stable political system, no matter how big and powerful they get, that Chinese people will be happy as long as they've got a job and you know, relative security, uh, right. but no political freedom, uh, despite the fact that they're very well educated and interact with other parts of the world, you know, readily. And I just don't know the answer to that. Uh, I would think that it's hard for that kind of a population to forever live in this kind of, you know, closed environment, but, you know, we'll just have to see. So where do we go from here? Most of the West has bandwagoned I use that air in air quotes, bandwagoned to the U.S. in order to resist China, but that isn't necessarily guaranteed to last. I'm thinking of some of the historical rivalries in Europe. Um, 
how, how could we possibly see the current, um, you know, the last 50 years of alliances shift? Uh, Professor Morris. Yeah, I think we should be ready to expect to see some very, very dramatic shifts. And, and at the moment, it's sort of kind of hard to imagine the European Union deciding to throw in its lot completely with China. So we are even, even harder to imagine the United States deciding to combine with China to balance and dominate Europe. But you know, compared to the kind of geostrategic changes that were happening just 100, 150 years ago, those wouldn't actually be that big. I mean, this, this is something I g gave quite a bit of time to in my book that, you know, 150 years ago, Britain's traditional ally, enemies rather, were France and Russia. Its traditional ally was Germany, um, because Britain would ally with Germany to encircle France. Come 1914, those alliances have been completely tossed out of the window. Um, Germany has been redefined as the number one enemy. France and Russia are now the close allies, and Britain ends up moving under the American wing. So things can change very dramatically. And I think, I mean, actually, if I can just connect this back to the last question you raised about um, about you know, what, what Chinese people might think about the world going forward. And I think we should also be asking ourselves what Western people are going to be thinking about the world as things go forward. Because when you look at the long run of history, what you find is rather depressing, well, one of the many rather depressing things that come out of historical perspective, soft power tends to follow hard. Um, when the Romans conquer most of Europe, people start becoming Roman. When the Han Dynasty in China conquers more and more of what we now consider China, people start to become Han, start to become Chinese. Um, 150 years ago, when the British were becoming very conscious of the rise of American power, they worried about Americanization. Americans weren't worrying about Britishization. And of course, the, the Americans were quite, and the British were both right about this. Um, Europe did become more Americanized. And I, I just a few, like, like Frank was saying just a few years ago, we were all talking, and then George Bush had this famous line about you know, trade with China and time is on our side. Everything was going to become more and more Western because the West was obviously better. I mean, if China succeeds in outperforming Western economies across the next 50 years, if its military buildup leads to the results that its leaders are now saying, I think something else, so that it's rather, again, rather hard to picture right now, but something else that we should not be surprised to see is the rest of the world becoming more like China. I would say we're actually beginning to see this a little bit already. Um, Absolutely. The, the, the appeal of authoritarian leaders, you know, Frank again writes about in his book, we're living in a world where increasing numbers of people are willing to say, we will give these guys the power that they demand because heck, maybe that's going to work better than having some corrupt, weak, hopeless democracy in charge of things. Um, so I think, I suspect we're living in one of these great historical pivots at the moment, that over the next 20 or 30 years, we should expect to see really profound changes in the world. Yeah, I would, uh, I would add uh, to that, that one of the biggest changes uh, geopolitically may actually come about here in the United States, uh, because our political system has suddenly become potentially quite unstable. Um, you know, if President Trump is reelected in 2024, you know, John Bolton had, had said that he had planned to pull out of NATO uh, if he had been given a second term, you know, in 2020. Uh, and uh, I think that given everything that's happened, if he comes back into power, he'll make good on that promise. And then that really has major consequences in Europe because NATO without the United States isn't, isn't a significant alliance. You know, for all their brave talk about a European defense, uh, a common defense uh, posture, France and Germany are not going to substitute for, you know, American uh, power and, and will. And that is really going to scramble uh, geopolitics in that entire European region. So I think that um, it's not, I mean, we have been going uh, through this slow decline in our soft power that Ian referred to. Uh, where people no longer really look up to the United States in the, in the manner that they did. But if this kind of populist trend really comes back in a big way, America turns decidedly isolationist, then um, you know, that's also going to affect the way that everybody else sees the US. And those countries that rely on us are not going to be able to do that anymore. Definitely. Yeah, I, I have a lot of thoughts on that. And I feel like I could ask tons of questions, but I do want to make sure we get to a couple of questions from our audience. Um, Alfie asks, what happens with the global world, world order given China does become the strongest global leader? And that brings me to 
What are your thoughts on the vicinity strap here? Uh, well, maybe I'll say something quickly since I, I come from a classics background, spent a lot of my life reading and talking about Thucydides. Um, yeah, I, I, because Thucydides have got very much into <clears throat> public discourse recently through Graham Allison's book about the um, you know, inevitable war coming uh, China and the US. And um, the Thucydides trap read narrowly what Thucydides says. Um, his, his line is Athens and Sparta go to war in 431 BCE. Um, not for all the reasons people said at the time, but because of the growth of Athenian power and Spartan fear of that power. And that is something you can generalize to many, many historical cases. And Graham Allison does it very nicely in this book, talking about all the times there's been war because one, a great power like the United States is terrified of the rise of a new power like China. But what he doesn't do is talk about all the times when war didn't happen. All the times when there's been a rising power that the power sitting on top of the world doesn't go to war with. And so um, while I think he's quite right to see a sort of loose analogy between 5th century BC Greece and 21st century global politics, that just doesn't even begin to make war necessary a necessary outcome. And furthermore, the consequences of US-China war will be so horrendous that you know, it, it's not like the 19th century where, you know, Germany could think of a short war, you know, against France or Russia and come out victorious by the end of the summer and that was it. That just ain't going to happen anymore. Another question we have, what will be the outcome of the battle of soft power of the West against China and Russia? Will we have two separate economies, maybe? Suppose? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, one of the biggest economic issues hanging over the world is really the future of the dollar, mm -hmm. uh, especially after this move uh, by Western central banks to freeze Russian uh, assets. Um, you know, there are a lot of countries in the world that have been using the dollar. Now, people have been worried about the decline of the dollar for decades, and it hasn't happened yet. Uh, but at some point, you know, there will be an alternative that's viable. And uh, I think that, you know, the exclusion of Russia uh, is going to drive, you know, things in that direction. However, you know, given how slow that process has been in the past, I wouldn't expect, you know, any very dramatic changes. But certainly from the standpoint of a country like India or Indonesia, you know, you are going to want to have alternatives to this American dollar denominated uh, you know, global uh, payment system. Mr. Morris, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, I, I think I would largely agree with what Frank said. And I think we we do already have already seen the beginnings of a move in this direction. And like the U.S. Um, very strongly opposed the creation of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. A lot of countries, including a lot of America's closest allies, went ahead and joined it anyway. And I think. One of the downsides of the one of the many downsides of the Ukrainian war is that if um, the uh, Western economic pressures on on Russia are successful, it's going to be an impetus for any um, ruling party in a country that thinks there's even a possibility of falling afoul of the United States. It's going to make a lot of sense to start drifting toward a Chinese alternative um, to the dollar denominated global system. So yeah, again, I think we should expect to see profound changes in the coming 20 or 30 years in the global order. Well, gentlemen, it has been a distinct pleasure and an honor to uh, speak with you this evening. Thank you very much for joining us. It is now, it's been one hour, unfortunately, but I know I could keep, keep going, but I want to thank you for your time this evening to speak to our constituency here in Dallas. Um, I want to remind our audience that you can purchase copies of both of these books we have been discussing, Geography is Destiny, Britain and the World, A 10,000 Year History, and liberalism and its discontent from our partners at Interrobank Books, which is our local bookstore here in Dallas. Do not order off of Amazon, support your local bookstores. I know I will be uh, picking up a copy uh, to finish my reading as I head to uh, a beach vacation very soon. So it's good beach reading. Uh, if you are not yet a member of the World Affairs Council, please join us. You can go ahead and visit dfwworld.org for more information on our membership. Thank you all very much for joining us. Gentlemen, thank you for taking the time. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thanks for having me.